Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another CyrusEye lecture. My name is Vivian Yin. I am a oculoplastic and orbital oncology surgeon at the University of British Columbia. Um, so today I thought we will address the issues of orbital inflammatory disorder. Uh, as most of you know, this is a spectrum of disease where um, I'm not going to be able to cover everything that constitutes an orbital inflammatory disorder, but I thought we would go over some of the most common and some of the stuff you don't want to miss uh, because of potential morbidity or mortality to the patient. So feel free to um, put into question, uh, the Q&A dialog box any questions you have as we go. If it's appropriate for me to answer at the time because it's a clarification of something I've said, I would do so um, at that time. Um, if it's a general question that requires a little bit more explanation, then I'll talk about them at the very end. Okay, so let's get started. Um, for today, because as I mentioned that this is a um, wide spectrum of disease and we're not going to be able to cover er details of every specific disorder, um, I want us to have at least at a bare minimum an approach to how to diagnose these um, diseases. Um, specifically, for those of you who's been to my lectures in the past, you'll know that I'm a huge fan of um, ophthalmologists having at least a basic understanding of how to read CT scans. I think that is within everyone's wheelhouse. And what you're trying to look for on the CT scan is um, signs or some signs or um, clues that will allow you to think about things that are dangerous, things that you don't want to miss, things that you want to dig a little deeper. And then I do want us to look at a couple of differentiating pathology features, not because we're going to be reading these slides necessarily, but sometimes even when you get a report from the pathologist, they will use certain word that is supposed to indicate to you whether they're high risk or low risk and things that you should be worrying about. And then lastly, of course, avoiding some of the treatment pitfalls. So everything we do as surgeons or as doctors have uh, side effects or complications. And I think it's very important to know how to deal with those. And that's what makes you um, not just a good uh, physician, but an excellent one. So um, this topic can be rather dry at times. So um, the best way for me to help you remember these cases uh, or these diseases is by showing you uh, real life cases of mine. So this first one is a 12 year old boy who presented with some swelling on the left upper lid and was actually previously treated and diagnosed as having dacryoadenitis. Now, this was the outside scan um, on um, presentation on your left, and then three days later, and usually patients get rescanned because they're not responding to therapy. So because he was treated as a uh, presumed infectious dacryoadenitis, he was put on broad span spectrum antibiotic, and we'll talk about um, choice of antibiotic a little bit later. Um, but looking at this, um, what will be some of the things that may give you a clue as to what is actually going on here? So uh, this is going to get our brain juice going uh, nice and early. So what are the signs on this scan that I showed you earlier on the, um, that is now uh, on the bottom right of your screen that you think will help you with your diagnosis? Is it the indentation of the globe that you see slightly there? Is it sinus findings? Is it the temporal swelling of soft tissue? Or is it none of the above? Is it only diagnosable by a tissue biopsy? So I'll give it a few more seconds. Now, these are not meant to trick you. These are just meant to highlight some of the points that I want you to make sure you get. Um, so most of you felt that it was a temporal soft tissue swelling. Um, um, and then the second is the indentation of the globe. Um, sorry, I don't speak Spanish. Um, um, but I will get Lawrence from CyberSight to help uh, with uh, any questions you have later on uh, if you have some Spanish question, uh, question that you want to ask in Spanish. Um, so the most important feature on the CT scan is actually the sinus finding. So you'll see, um, as I'm trying to outline with my pointer here, um, that there is sinus opacity. 
This is an atypical presentation of orbital cellulitis. Um, now, swelling is something that is very easy for us to um, hone in on. And I'm just going to go back to the previous slide um, to try to show you that, you know, even early on, you can sort of see that um, there's hypodensity within this mass that has a slightly hyperdensity around it. And then you'll see that the sinus opacity involves mostly the ethmoidal, uh, but you're, you're starting to see some maxillary opacity as well. And then on the second stand, you definitely see complete uh, filling of that maxillary sinus. Now, of course, I'm trying to show you this scan because I wanted you to comment on the pronounced temporal swelling, and I wanted you to comment on the indentation of the globe, but trying to tell you that those two findings are usually nonspecific. So the temporal swelling can happen if there's a bad enough orbital inflammation uh, because of spillover. And it can be actually indication of either infectious causes, inflammatory causes, or even malignant causes. As we know, malignancy can cause um, a secondary inflammatory response as the body responds to the tumor. So the thing you wanna look for is, is there a sinus opacity? And then go from there. So, Moving on. So in terms of orbital cellulitis, now most of this talk is going to be about non-infectious uh, organism, but we can't um, look at non-infectious causes unless we know what to look for on an infectious cause. So this is really just a highlight to you that look for the common things being common first. So infectious orbital cellulitis is still the number one cause. And I told you that this was a 12 year old uh, child. So in children, this is by far the number one thing you're gonna see in the orbit that is gonna cause a red hot, red hot eye. And for children, most of them are uh, your usual kind of upper respiratory tract infection uh, organism. So your common strep, uh, both strep A, and non-hemolytic uh, strep. Uh, Staph aureus, now MRSA infection is actually becoming more common in children depending on where you are in the world. So I put it in bracket because it's still less common to have a pediatric population already um, um, having MRSA, uh, but um, it's becoming uh, something that you should at least think about. And then H flu. And then now um, there's more and more children with polymicorbial infection as well. And then most recent uh, review in 2018 found that now it's up as, has, as high as a third, uh, which is uh, much higher than what textbook used to talk about in terms of pediatric uh, cellulitis. Um, the, the old school teaching that 30% uh, will respond to antibiotic um, still holds. And of course, if they're less than nine, it's more likely that they will respond to antibiotic alone. The case I've shown you is one that which did not. Uh, and those are the cases that you want to think about surgical draining of those abscesses. Um, for those who are less than five, the number one initial recommendation is actually to cover with cephalosporin. Um, I'm talking a little bit about antibiotic because I, I want to make sure that people don't just um, always think that as first line for cellulitis, you should use broad spectrum. In children, you can actually use single agent as a starting point because they do tend to be uh, um, mono organ uh, involving, mono organism involving rather than uh, polymicrobial. So you use broad spectrum antibiotic if you think this is a polymicrobial infection. So if it's an older kid, then maybe it's not a bad thing to start with uh, broad spectrum. But if it's a younger child, um, it's okay to start with a single agent and watch them carefully. There's more and more literature now about starting steroid earlier. Um, they have a better course and a shorter duration in, in uh, hospital. Um, there's some debate. There's a, uh, a study that came out uh, written by a colleague of mine that talked about starting steroid immediately. So they offer parents the option to start IV steroid concurrently with antibiotic um, instead of um, 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 starting steroid afterwards. Um, I would say I still err on the side of being cautious, so it uh, makes me a little bit uncomfortable to start concurrently. Um, so I tend to let at least one or two dose of antibiotic in before I start IV steroid. Um, the dosage is typically not as high dose as we use for other inflammatory disorder, which I'll talk about later. So you can use a, a 0.3 milligram per kilogram dosage. 
if this was an adult, so adult, you're going to ask me, what's the cutoff? And I'm going to say, well, there really is a one. 18 is not a magic number. Uh, a, in my case, a 12-year-old, you start think of them as a little adult. Um, but when I say adult, in this case, about thinking about necrotizing fasciitis, we're really talking about like middle-aged adults. So if you're dealing with like a 60-year-old or, or, or older or, you know, even sometimes 55-year-old, you start to think more about necrotizing fasciitis and fungus and make sure that those are always on your differential and, and especially if they're not responding. Um, in terms of orbital inflammation or infection in COVID-19 patients, um, I personally have not, only because BC, uh, where I am in Vancouver, has not had a lot of uh, COVID patients. We have seen uh, conjunctivitis patients. Uh, we did have one patient who were, were suspicious of COVID-19 uh, with an orbital inflammation, but the patient ended up being swab negative. Uh, colleagues of mine from the U.S. have shared a lot of patients with orbital inflammation secondary to COVID. Um, that will not be within uh, this talk, but I can briefly touch upon that in the very end. Um, so kind of telling you what a orbital cellulitis looked like, and I wanted to contrast it with this. So this was another patient who was sent in actually with the diagnosis of presumed uh, orbital cellulitis with an abscess. And the referral actually uh, requested for me to drain this abscess. Um, the photo on your right there is not very clear because this was actually uh, a photo I took from her um, electronic medical record profile. But this was the day that she came to see me. And you can see that she has some fullness of her right upper limb, maybe a slight proptosis. Um, but other than that, her eye is not that hot, uh, and the imaging finding, the two view of the CT is shown to you on your left there. Now, looking at this scan, though, uh, what would you say are your signs that support this being an orbital cellulitis? Um, is it the subperiosteal abscess that you see there, uh, which was the reason for referral? Is it that list swelling and fullness that I mentioned earlier? Is it her age? Um, and I mentioned to you that one of the presenting reasons why she even went to emerge and got the scan was that she was having headache, or is it none of the above? So um, I'm glad that everyone is now paying attention to superiorosal abscess. And this one, one that was um, classic, kind of what I told you of um, slightly hyper uh, signaling at the edges and then hypodense in the middle. So by all means, at this looks and smells like a superiorosal abscess. The one thing that I'm trying to highlight with this is when things don't look, look typical, and what do I mean by typical is that the kid, you saw the superiorosal abscess involving the orbital side of things. But one of the things about this, this particular patient that made me thought it was unusual was the fact that the abscess carried into the brain. So you'll see that there's an intracranial component of it. And you can see it on the sagittal most prominently, but even on the um, coronal, you can see it. The other sign to look for is bone. So see how there's a breach in bone here? So if this was a simple um, orbital cellulitis, the things that are missing is the eye is not red and hot. So anything there's a, anytime there's an inflammatory or infectious cause, like the kid you saw with the profound uh, temporal swelling. This lady's eye, besides a little bit of swelling, is pretty quiet. So for someone who has an intracranial extension of an infection that started in the orbit, um, the picture doesn't fit. And then the other thing is previously I told you to look for sinuses, right? That was our indicating factor that this was a orbital cellulitis. And you see on her scan, her sinuses are pristine, right? You can even see this, the start of the sphenoiditis right here on this side, and there's nothing there. Um, so the picture is not fitting. She's missing the red and hot eye. She's missing sinus opacity, which is a, almost a um, requirement for the diagnosis of a superiorosseal abscess. Um, so this lady actually had diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. I did go in and try to find out what was going on here for the combined purpose of one, if it is an abscess, I will drain it. But really what I was trying to get at is a biopsy to figure out what was going on. Either this was something incredibly unusual, um, like I was thinking um, a typical organism like an, um, 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 
uh, like parasitic infection, like cystero cystero uh, cystero um or um, you know, this is probably not an infection. So the, this case is a highlight, you know, orbital cellulitis may be a topic that you think is boring and that um, it's, you know, how to deal with it. Uh, but it's even uh, more important to know that when the pictures don't fit perfectly, think about potential for alternative diagnosis. In terms of imaging choices, I per personally prefer CT. Um, and the reason is because it, MRI will not tell you things like bone breaches. Um, and as you can tell from this case, how important bone is. So um, I think CT is something that is quick and a f good first starting point. MRI is superior if you're trying to really delineate, you know, crystal clear soft tissue delineation, such as, you know, if um, after the biopsy, we want to know whether this is invading, meaning infiltrating the brain or not, then MRI will be much better uh, than CT on that. Uh, but for I would say 95% of, of the things we do, we actually don't need an MRI. Okay, so um, if there's no more question about orbital cellulitis or those two cases, then I'm gonna move on. Um, B cell lymphoma from intracranial invading the orbit versus orbit to the intracranial. So the honest truth is, Andreas, we, we don't know. So a lot of these cases, uh, as you know, uh, B cell lymphomas or lymphomas in general are blood diseases. So the assumption is that it is circulating in the patient's entire system. Um, that particular case was interesting because the foci almost looked like it's coming from bone. Uh, of course, we know it's not, uh, just logically knowing what the fused large B cell lymphoma is doing. Um, more likely that that probably could have started from either the intracranial or the orbit, um, and then one invaded the other. Uh, by the shape of it, it's probably more likely that cases started intraorbital and then one intracranial, and that's probably why she was having a headache, and that was why she got scanned. Um, I think we do have a lecture, uh, I think one of my previous lecture about orbital syndromes, there was, I did cover the topic of um, diffuse, uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma of the orbit. Um, so uh, if you look up on the archive, uh, I believe you can find the lecture there. Uh, bone erosion and lymphoma. It's actually not as rare as you think. Um, so with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, I find bone involvement is much earlier. Um, if it's mold lymphoma, then you're right, bone involvement is not that common. Um, so, so the fuse large, uh, I just had a case actually recently, it's not involved in this talk, uh, who also have pretty significant bony involvement. Uh, so I would say if you have bone involvement, then you think higher grade. So you think NKT cell lymphoma or you, see, you think uh, the fuse large B cell lymphoma. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so, um, you know, the first kid um, is kind of our starting point, and he was referred in as dacryadenitis. So I wanted to show you what a dacryadenitis should look like. Um, you need to know what the most typical presentation look like in order to know when things are atypical. Uh, so this is what a tip, the most typical dacryadenitis looks like. So if, the, if this was the scan I got sent, then I am pretty comfortable that I don't even need to examine the patient or talk to the patient that I can pretty much treat on spec. And some of the feature on this scan is the fact that, well, it's clearly lacrimal gland. So you can see that it involves the gland morphology, whereas on the other side, you see the slim, uh, thin and slender profile of the globe. And then on the axial, you can see that there's not really any posterior extension. So if this was a uh, lacrimal gland dacryadenitis uh, that is of non-infectious or non-inflammatory origin, uh, and it's actually a malignancy, you're gonna see posterior extension. So the gland tend to enlarge circumferentially. So so it should not just be anterior, but it should actually extend posteriorly as well. And then this kind of heterogeneity is very typical of an infectious dacryadenitis. Uh, so if you see heterogeneity within the, the lacrimal gland mass, that is less likely or highly unlikely to be a malignancy and that you don't have to worry about um, uh, missing something and that you can actually treat as an infectious cause first. Um, and uh, I'll come back to orbital cellulitis in adults because I, I want to just finish this component about dacryadenitis. Um, so dacryadenitis uh, is a Latin word that just means inflammation of the lacrimal gland. It actually is not, uh, it, the word itself does not tell you what the underlying cause is. 
Um, so you can think of them that they could be infectious or they could be inflammatory, or as I mentioned, it could be masquerades. Um, so um, slapping the patient with, with a diagnosis of Dacron is it actually doesn't tell me what do you think is actually going on. Of the infectious causes, like all uh, infectious causes, whether it's orbital cellulitis or dacoronitis, it could be bacterial or viral or atypical. Um, a typical infection of the lacrimal gland is, is actually quite rare. Um, I'll highlight some of them, which is on the, which I'm calling them inflammatory here, um, um, but um, they, they're um, like uh, the one that comes to mind is I just had a patient with, with potential syphilis of the lacrimal gland. So those are quite atypical and you probably won't see um, um, them very often in your practice. And usually those in terms of diagnosis, you're really looking for other systemic sign in order to help you with the diagnosis. Um, so we'll cover some of these infectious causes and we'll cover some of the inflammatory causes for sure. That will probably be the two uh, um, um, diff most difficult things for you to figure out whether it's inflammatory or infectious. We'll skip the masquerade because there's a whole lecture on lacrimal gland malignancy on cybersite I've given uh, a few uh, months ago as well. Um, so there's quite a few questions about uh, steroid use in orbital cellulitis in adults. Uh, so uh, I do not check CRP before you starting IV steroid. Um, uh, we can talk about that at the end again um, in terms of why uh, I will be curious to know why you will be thinking about using CRP as an indicator. Is it that you were thinking about using as a disease marker? Um, in terms of starting steroid in adult, yes, I follow um, uh, the same rule as well that I usually want a couple of doses on and uh, depends on how hot and how the patient presented. If I'm more worried about potential um, non-infectious causes, uh, then I tend to start the steroid a little bit earlier, almost as a trial to see if the steroid really helped or not. Uh, if I'm more worried about a typical infection or one of the infections that are harder to get a hold of, so if I'm thinking about necrotizing fasciitis or um, you know, a fungal infection, then I tend not to start steroid at all. So it is driven a little bit by what organism I'm thinking about. Um, and I do use uh, steroid routinely for the garden variety orbital cellulitis. It helps the patient recovery a lot faster uh, and you'll get the patient kind of out of the hospital faster as well as the patient um, would just kind of go back to work sooner. So that's why I, I do use it even in adults. In terms of how long do I use it for, I find um, you don't need it as long as for inflammatory causes. Uh, so typically I will give three doses um, and that's more than enough. Um, or sometimes I can even get away with just one high dose IV stairway uh, would be sufficient. We don't have enough evidence to show how should we really use steroid in cellulitis to tell you the truth because for a very long time people shied away from using it, thinking about that you will make the infections worse, you'll fight against your antibiotic. So I have to say that it's relatively uh, relatively new, meaning only in about the past five years or so that people have become more comfortable uh, with using steroid. Um, okay. So um, in terms of causative agent for infectious dacryonitis, which of these would you say is not a possible organism? So uh, I've kind of given away a little bit about this because I mentioned syphilis earlier as one of my patients. Um, and then um, um, can uh, herpes simplex be an organism, staph aureus, acanthamoeba, and Lyme? Well, which of these do you think is not a possibility? Perfect. So the reason I'm throwing this in there is that uh, we see acanthamoeba infections a lot uh, for corneal, but uh, there is no role of acanthamoeba in uh, dacryonitis. Uh, you'll be surprised that sometimes residents uh, tell me that a, a typical infection of the lacrimal gland is acanthamoeba, but um, uh, to our delight that that is not a possibility. Uh, the ones I don't want you guys to forget is herpes. In line. So these are what I would consider uh, less common dacryonitis causes, but they should be always on your differential. And yes, herpes should be on your differential for almost anything under the sun. Um, so not common, but definitely uh, herpes is so pervasive now in our society that it can cause 
almost any orbital cranial uh, syndrome, any cranial neuropathy, uh, any infectious or inflammatory causes. Um, so uh, here is a list for you of all the possible infectious dacroadenitis. We're not going to go over each of these, but I kind of categorize them in terms of frequency and color coded them for you. Um, so for bacterial, you're still dealing with the same organism of orbital cellulitis. So staph, strep, and H uh, flu are still your most common. In uh, dacroadenitis, uh, which is more common in adult than in children, um, you will also want to see think about Moraxella as well as Pseudomonas. Moraxella because it's also part of the upper respiratory tract infection organism that we think about. And then Pseudomonas uh, is what I would consider to be more of the quote unquote spectrum of atypical. TB and syphilis, of course, as I mentioned, and you'll see it once in the blue moon, but syphilis and TB are both on the rise in, in terms of its prevalence in our society across the world. Uh, because of that, you will see increased incidence of dacroadenitis because of these organisms as well. So for the sake of time, I'm going to go a little bit faster. Um, just to contrast a atypical presentation of dacroadenitis. So this was a young lady, 25-year-old, who presented with bilateral upper lip swelling and as you can see from the uh, scan, she has bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement. She was given um, prednisone uh, with presumed um, um, inflammatory causes of, of dacroadenitis for five days at relatively high dose. So 50 milligram, that's probably um, a young individual close to one milligram per mil, and there was no response. So at this point, you're probably thinking, you know, you want to, one, make sure that this is not uh, a malignancy masquerading, but bilateral lacrimal gland cancer is incredibly rare. I think I've seen one in my career, um, um, and it was a squamous cell, but uh, this is probably, when it's bilateral, uh, more likely still to be infectious, especially in this age group. So she actually was tested for uh, mono, uh, because of some other vague symptoms. And this was actually a case of bilateral lacrimal gland involvement from mono. Uh, so rare things do happen, and sometimes tissue biopsy do help you make those diagnoses uh, or doing a good uh, history and then a good inflammatory workup based off of your history. Um, switching gear a little bit to the non-infectious causes, um, so this was now an older individual, so a 71-year-old lady who actually was presented for um, chronic inflammation of her lower lid. And the reason of referral is actually this little spot right here. So I mentioned that I do um, um, a lot of oncology as well as orbit. So this lady was sent in to me to say, Corey, question mark, is this a cancer on her eyelid right here? Is this something that was a chronic inflammation that uh, was actually a uh, uh, malignancy that was missed for many years? And on their CT scan, you notice that there is this um, homogeneous mass in the medial orbit. Uh, you can see that it tracks uh, to probably the uh, posterior two-thirds of the orbit. Her vision was normal. Uh, she just kind of hot and inflamed, as you can see, caruncle uh, edema and injection throughout. Um, so this was a lady that actually had Wagner's. Now, what were the clues on, on CT scan that makes me start to think down this path? Uh, is that if you look very carefully, this is why I favor uh, CT because bone helps me a lot in my diagnosis. You'll notice that the bone is missing on this side, right? So if you compare it to the other side, even though orbital bone is quite thin, you can still see a faint line here. And you can see also the contour. So I always say, look for symmetry. Uh, we're a mirror image of each other, uh, of our two sides for a reason. And you'll see that there's bone disruption here. So there's now, no bone in this section. And then there's even some hyperostosis reaction, which is, goes along with inflammatory causes. And then if you look on the, the other thing is to make sure that all the scans look the same, so you know this is not an artifact. So if you look on the axial, similarly, I can't see that shape of the faint line that I see on the other side. So Wagner's or poly, uh, sorry, granulomatous polyangiitis, which is a new preferred terms now from, um, all of our rheumatology and the International Society's preference is a autoimmune uh, inflammatory disorder 
On pathology, um, it's important to distinguish this from the next entity we're going to talk about. Um, it's important to know that, yes, you get a mixed reaction, so you're going to get all of your um, inflammatory cells, including lymphocyte, eosinophils, plasma cells, and epithelioid. So what do they look like? So this is an epithelioid. So it looks different than your typical lymphocyte, which is are these really blue cells. So you can see if you aren't comfortable reading pathology size, the one thing I said you should take away from this is, are there a lot of blue cells? If there are lots of blue cells, then you think two things. One is inflammatory or one you think lymphoma. So then the next question you ask yourself is, all the blue cells all look exactly the same with nothing else but blue cells. If the, if the answer to that is no, then you're most likely dealing with an inflammatory cause like this one. So this is not just a sheet of literally blue Skittles with nothing else. And then the other thing you look for, is there any giant cell, multinucleated giant cells, which is this guy. So these big blobs with kind of a couple of different blue circles, you can see it here in high mag, but you can also see it on the low mag. See this? So this is a multinuclear giant cell. There's one there, there's one there, uh, there's one here, and there's lots of them throughout. So um, this is a sign that you're dealing with a typical Wagner's or granulomatous polyangiitis. What is nuclear dust? Nuclear dust is a word used in pathology to describe vasculitis. So this is nuclear dust. So this is a blood vessel you can see by the red. You can see that um, there is kind of breakdown uh, around those uh, microvasculature, and that's uh, telling you that this is a vasculitis. So these are small vessel vascula vasculitis, and that's kind of the hallmark of um, uh, GPA uh, for you. Like I mentioned, they're autoimmune. It is not com it's not common, quote unquote, when you compare it to diabetes or when you compare it to hypertension. But for uh, orbital condition, this is actually quite a high incidence. So it's three in 100,000. For most of our orbital condition, we're looking at like one out of 100,000. So this is actually something you will see in your practice in your lifetime. Um, the the, di the ser serological diagnosis is based on uh, a marker called ANCA, and ANCA is separated into C ANCA and P ANCA. For a long time, there was a lot of debate in terms of which of these two is diagnostically more common. Um, so historically in the literature, we know that C ANCA is more common in uh, Wagner's than P ANCA uh, by far, but more and more there's literature to show that maybe actually there are patients with just P ANCA elevation who actually do have Wagner. So don't dismiss those cases. There's 10% of the patients who have, have P ANCA elevation only. Um, orbital involvement is very, very common. 50% of your Wagner's patients are gonna have orbital uh, involvement. Um, and the ocular involvement, which is the cyclotrician conjunctivitis, scleritis, PUK, is actually less common than orbit. So as orbital specialists, we're gonna see these even more than our other ophthalmic uh, colleagues. The one worrisome thing with orbital Wagner is CSF leak. The bone erosion can involve um, the cribriform plate, and I'll show you a case of that uh, in an image later on. Um, and these patients do have mortality. You do not want to miss a patient with orbital Wagner's because they require multidisciplinary systemic investigation. Uh, patients with Wagner's do uh, have a higher mortality and an earlier mortality. And the key kind of high incidence of um, um, leading to mortality is uh, hospitalized for infection. So in hospital death, which is 2.5% of these patients, um, is most likely due to uh, inflammatory or sepsis. Um, renal failure occurs in about 28 of these patients. And by renal failure, I don't mean a little bit of kidney dysfunction or decreased kidney function. I mean end-stage kidney disease need, needing dialysis and kidney transplant. And unfortunately, most of these patients are low on the transplant list because if they get a transplant, they're just going to fail again because the Wagner's is not, if the Wagner's is not under control. So they tend to be slightly lower on the totem pole for a kidney transplant as well, which is unfortunate. Um, so um, early intervention and preventing them from getting to the stage of kidney failure is, is really important. The one thing that gets overlooked is that these patients also has a lot of cardiac abnormalities. So five-year cardiac event, meaning heart attack, cardiac failure, CHF, is actually as high as 11% of these patients. 
They can even have pneumothorax because infection, if they have a nodular involvement of their lungs, uh, those nodular involvement, just like they can eat through bones of the orbit, they can actually eat through structures of the lungs and cause a pneumothorax. So definitely don't take these lightly. They need uh, aggressive immunosuppression lifelong in order to prevent them from running into some of these mortality issues. In terms of treatment for GPA, it is, as I mentioned, uh, aggressive immunosuppressions. Uh, the specific number one or number two agent will change a little bit depending on where you are. So even within North America, there's an East Coast, West Coast divide. Uh, on the East Coast, methotrexate tend to be the first uh, agent people go to. On the West Coast, people like cyclophosphamide a little bit more. Uh, why is there such a, a difference? Um, I don't know. I think it's just habit. It depends on where you're trained and you tend to stay in practice where you're trained. Uh, and because of that, um, um, I think there's a slight divide between the first two there. Uh, rituximab is uh, becoming more and more of a favor as a first line because of its uh, better tolerability compared to methotrexate and cyclophosphamide in terms of side effect profile. However, it's way more expensive than cyclophosphamide and, and, and methotrexate. So I would say by and large, you're going to see those two agents as uh, first line uh, um, drug and then followed by rituximab as the third one that you're going to see. IVIG, um, uh, mycophenolate and azotherapin um, has uh, more to do with, especially azotherapin is mostly for maintenance dose because of how well tolerated it is. IVIG and mycophenolate tend to be for refractory cases if they break through methotrexate or progress on methotrexate and cyclophosphamide. Relapse rate is really high. Um, these patients sometimes do get um, um, a dosage drop or a drug holiday, uh, but when they do that, they do tend to relapse. And at five year, half of these patients actually relapse, even if you did get some form of drug holiday or control uh, in the beginning. So don't let these patients discharge from your practice. They really do need at least at a bare minimum a, a, one, a yearly touch base. Um, so looking at another um, paid case that I kind of promised you about what how bad Wagner's can get. So this is another lady, 69-year-old, who came in actually, uh, unfortunately, um, not well controlled. Uh, she was uh, lost to follow-up. She lived in northern part of BC, which is a really, really rural community and hard to get to with few specialists. So she actually presented to us with CSF leak. And then uh, after her CSF leak, as you can see, the missing cribriform plate here. Uh, after that was stabilized and she was uh, discharged from hospitalization, she was asked for um, some help uh, from myself and a plastic team for dealing with the progressive corneal thinning she has. Now you can see that she has no orbital bone on either side, uh, but it's the left side that was more um, severe. And you can see that she almost have no soft tissue covering this globe. So you can understand how she could have corneal thinning. She just have complete non-wetting of her um, um, ocular surface. Surface. And this is a clinical photo of her. Uh, on the surface, she doesn't look so bad. And this is post reconstruction. So we try to close the hole on the left side and reconstruct some sort of glow protection. Um, and really, you're not trying to make her look pretty. We're actually uh, trying to close it with the least invasive uh, approach possible, recognizing that she will probably break through until her Wagner is under control. Um, so we're saving a free flap for a rainy day. But you can see even with a strong glabellar flap, this is actually a paramedian. So it follows the blood vessel. So this is a vast flap that we rotated in. You can see that she's already fistulized, starting to fistulize up here that you can see by the error and she's starting to fistulize down here already. And on her other side, she also have a small hole that was starting to fistulize. So these are cases which you're going to be chasing your tail as a surgeon unless medically they really immunosuppress her a well and she stabilizes. You can also see the classic telltale sign of her nose changing shape because of the bony changes when Wagner as well. Um, okay, so we are um, about halfway through. We're going to talk a little bit about another uh, inflammatory spectrum of disease. So um, switching gear to another disease, this is a 71-year-old lady who also presents with actually droopy eyelid for a year and came in requesting for a ptosis repair. And you can see on the scan here that she has 
this fullness in her right orbit um, centered around the lacrimal gland. And you can see that this lacrimal gland looks very different than the previous one I've shown you. So this is homogeneous. There's no um, heterogeneity to this enlargement. And like, unlike the lac dacroadenitis that I showed you earlier, which was predominantly just an enlargement with just involving in the front without this tail, this lady looked very different. So this was actually a lady with sarcoid. So this will be categorized under kind of a atypical enlargement of your lacrimal gland. Uh, sarcoid contrasts from Wagner's and that on pathology, even though both of them are, are inflammation, this one is non-necrotizing. So Wagner's also have a lot of fibrosis shown. This one does not have any fibrosis. And, and you're seeing these kind of lobules. This is because this is a uh, lacrimal gland specimen. Um, this is not these kind of pink line in between is not because of necrosis. These are because these are the natural septation that occurs within the lacrimal gland. But you can see lots of little blue dots, but it's not a sheet of blue. So this is not lymphoma. If this was a lymphoma of the lacrimal gland, you're going to see just uniform blues throughout. Um, so this is what sarcoid looks like with all these little lymphocytes that you can see. Um, let's see, you know, you see these ductual architecture that is still preserved, showing you that this is a lacrimal gland. Um, um, so this is a sarcoid, which is a rare cause of lacrimal gland uh, inflammation. Um, Non-caseating is another term for non-necrotizing uh, granulomas, and they do have a high propensity for lung involvement. However, 50% of these cases have no lung involvement, but they have a very high propensity for eye involvement in, in about 40%. They are more common in African American in the North American literature, almost by about threefold uh, or higher. And th steroid is still the first line for these patients. So unlike Wagner's, which you pretty much get them almost immediately on both steroid and immunosuppression, in sarcoid cases, you can try to see if you can get away with getting a remission with steroid alone. Um, and then if that, you know, doesn't quite happen as well as you want to, then you can start immunosuppression with methyltrexate. There's more and more literature on trying to use TNF-alpha blockers, and there's quite a number of clinical trials ongoing in the world about multi-center trial about this. Um, once again, these newer drugs uh, are, are being investigated because they're better tolerated, they have less side effects. Uh, however, they also come at a price. So all of these agents are much more expensive by net magnitudes of five to 10 folds compared to methotrexate. These patients are much easier to get remission. So about two thirds, you're gonna get them remission, meaning off drugs with no disease involvement present in about two thirds of the cases. In contrast to Wagner, which is really, really hard to get them uh, into complete remission, even then they uh, relapse quite commonly. Um, there's a lot of controversy about ACE level about 10 years ago in terms of um, uh, how useful are they in terms of diagnosis for sarcoid. Sarcoid is a very difficult disease to actually diagnose. Tissue is um, um, king uh, in terms of um, 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 helping you with this diagnosis. Um, however, um, ACE level was something that talked that is taught to us as the, the marker for diagnosis. So I thought we should touch on this. ACE is not very sensitive for sarcoid diagnosis at all. That's the bottom line. And I included the ocular diagnosis symptom there for you. Um, more and more, the diagnostic criteria in recent year uh, from 2019, 2020 are based on consensus statement of expert who treats sarcoid. And more and more, it's actually uh, like how we diagnose let's say multiple sclerosis, um, that is on a spectrum of um, clinical findings and radiographic findings. And you have a scoring sheet about whether this is a probable um, case of sarcoid or uh, definitive or likely. Uh, so that kind of tells you that um, look these up if you have a case that you really think um, smells like sarcoid, but you're not getting the serum markers that you want for a definitive diagnosis. Now, if you do have an elevation of ACE and you have the classic clinical symptom, then that is a definitive case of sarcoid. Uh, sarcoid can look also much more inflammatory. So this is an example of an inflammatory case of sarcoid. Um, so you see the kind of um, sclerosis, um, um, 
um, conjunctivitis, inflammatory conjunctivitis, and potential a little bit of early kind of PUK on this patient, much more swelling than my case, and much more kind of prominent of an orbital finding. So sarcoid can present with uh, more inflammatory look or more of a quiet look, which was my case uh, without much swelling and just kind of a ptosis and some fullness in the upper lid. Um, now, moving on to another inflammatory uh, syndrome, and these are the three that I really want you to take home with because some people may not have seen them in their career. Uh, so this was a younger patient now, instead of the 70-year-old, which I showed you in the two previous cases, this was a 13-year-old female and um, comes and also complains about lip swelling. Most of these patients will come and saying that they have a fullness of their upper lid and their lips droopy and want you to fix the lid. And um, when you scan the child, uh, you notice that there's significant bony destruction. Uh, um, and um, on the uh, CT, uh, sorry, on the MRI scan on the sagittal, you'll notice that it's not infiltrative. So uh, the brain is being pushed rather than being eaten eat into. Um, so this sign is important because whenever we see bony destruction, we're thinking cancer. Uh, so, but then this kind of reassure you that it's not an infiltrative mass. So this was actually a classic imaging finding of Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm not going to do this poll, and I'm just going to move on um, so that we have enough time to talk about uh, some of these questions you're having, which are all great questions. So Langerhans cell histiocytosis is actually very common in the frontal bone and in, in the orbit, which commonly presents to an orbital surgeon rather than a neurosurgeon. Um, it has a broad systemic involvement. So it has all these categorization because it's a spectrum of disease. So it can be unisystem, meaning if it's just the orbit or involves multiple organs, then it's considered multi-system. It can also be multifocal or unifocal. What do I mean by that? So it can be involving both orbit or both kidneys. So then it will be multifocal, uh, but unisystem. So that's what I mean by system versus focality. Uh, it's an eosinophilic granuloma. So remember how earlier I showed you uh, the eosinophil? So they look very different than the lymphocyte. The lymphocytes are much more denser. And most of us don't do microscopy. So this is really for um, 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 academic purpose, but on your exam, they might still want to test you on this, which is these on EM, you'll see these classic granules. Um, so these are diagnostic of Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Um, and it constitutes about one to 3% of pediatric orbit uh, tumors. Uh, and as I mentioned, orbital involvement is actually very common. So the good news with this disease is it may have a horrible imaging finding and get you really, really worried uh, initially, but these are easily treated. So for the orbital disease, they respond beautifully to keratage, meaning you do an incision. You don't have to try to, quote unquote, cut it out neatly like the way we do with other orbital um, masses. You can actually take a small curette and just kind of shell it out like an ice cream, and they do come out in little fragments. Um, so they're not encapsulated usually. And if you have any residual that you're worried about, you can actually inject a little bit of steroid and it melts away beautifully with no residual whatsoever. So these are uh, uh, quite easily treated surgically. There are a couple of spectrum um, or or I would say uh, multi-system involvement of Langerhans cell that has gotten names to them. That is all it is. Uh, so um, Hand, uh, Schuler, and Christian is the one that has DI, so di diabetes insipidus. And they tend to be older individual and tend to be multifocal as well. And then the ab Luiter and Swit uh, is the one that we really worry about because these are highly fatal. And they're the one that has multi-organ involvement and multi-organ system failure uh, and are typically young and comes in quite sick. And um, uh, these are the two that also exams like to ask you about because you want to make sure that you remember that some of these kids can be quite sick and you really have to involve a pediatrician and a pediatric rheumatologist. Uh, with these 
spectrum diseases, these ones that are named, survival is quite poor. Uh, so two-year survival um, is less than 87%. Uh, once again, just make sure that you check these uh, children if they present to your clinic as a first presentation, that they don't have other systemic involvement. If it's just orbital involvement, those kids do very, very well. Uh, one uh, last case, and we'll highlight one last disease, uh, and then I'll get to some of your questions. Um, this is now an older individual, 78-year-old, also coming with swelling. This, there's always a story of fall. So I never trust a, a story of fall because I feel like everyone, everyone older than 60, 65, we're going to tell you that they have a fall history. Um, so they had a fall three years ago and progressively have gotten more and more swelling of her right eye. Uh, another um, lacrimal gland mask that you see here or centered on around the lacrimal gland, some indentation of the globe, which just tells you that the mass is firm. And then, as I mentioned, always look for bone changes. So this is a classic bone change that I call is actually uh, bone erosion or bone molding around uh, the tumor. So why do I use that word or why do I highlight that? Unlike the kid, which I showed you earlier, which I'm going to go back to and just make sure that you, you get that differentiating fact. So see how sharp this edge is, how it's like a square and how it's like a square. It's almost like I took a saw and just cut that off and how there's like this kind of moth-eaten appearance. These are bones that is what I consider eaten away um, by whatever process is going on. And in contrast to that, if you look at this case, it's smooth. It doesn't have like, it has a point to it. So it's not a me taking a saw and cutting off an edge. Uh, and it doesn't have any, it's very smooth appearing. So these are telling you that this process has been chronic and it's just slowly eaten through rather than um, um, slowly kind of molded through rather than eaten away by, by whatever process is going on. This tells me it's more likely to be a benign and chronic um, um, condition rather than an acute and, 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 and uh, malignant versus one of these lytic, meaning bone eating uh, diseases. So um, even though it looks very prominent and it's, a, it's, it's kind of molding away some of these bone, uh, I was leaning towards probably this is most likely uh, an inflammatory disorder. And this was a patient with an IgG4 disease. Um, I want to highlight this because there's more and more literature talking about this now. It is an immune-mediated and it's fibro-inflammatory. So unlike the non-caseaning lacrimal gland case of uh, Sarco I showed you earlier, in contrast, this one has a lot of necrosis. It is an older individual, and, and unlike the previous cases, which we all we saw that most of my patients were female, this one has a male predominance. And lacrimal gland involvement in these spectrum of disease is about 20%, so also not low. Um, in terms of involvement of within the orbit, what is the most common? Lacrimal gland is the most common, and then soft tissue or muscle can be involved as well. Uh, IgG4 is, is also, like sarcoid, very difficult to diagnose. Uh, so most recently, um, um, they come up with a system to try to categorize into, into definitive, possible, or probable. Um, so like most of the difficult to diagnose, you're going to find them into uh, three categories like this. And this is all coming out of the rheumatoid, uh, rheumatology and arthritis uh, literature. And it's based on a combination of clinical, histopathological, and serum findings. Now, once again, we're lucky in orbit that it's not that easy, it's not that hard for us to get uh, tissue. So tissue diagnosis is still the, the easiest one to find uh, much more of a definitive diagnosis of things. Um, here is a spectrum of all the different systemic involvement that it could get besides the neck, uh, besides lacrimal gland, salivary gland is also very common and it's actually quite common to be bilateral. And then here are the listed of the other organ system, pretty much lung, uh, pancreas, anything you can think of, um, um, the blurry duct, uh, the renal um, wall, uh, as well as re even retroperitoneal fibrosis can occur. Management, like uh, some of the other inflammatory syndromes, first line is still steroid. And you'll see a recurrent theme that a lot of these agents overlap. So like 
what we talked about earlier with Sarko and Wegner's, how methotrexate and rituximab becomes your first or second line treatment. Same thing with IgG4. If you can get them on steroid and get in them into remission with just steroid alone, great. Um, if you cannot, then you start to fall back on the second line, which is predominantly rituximab and methotrexate. And then third line become your mycophenolate and azothioprine. These patients do tend to go into re, uh, relap as well. However, steroid alone remission is pretty high. So 60% of patients, you can get them on steroid with a slow taper and then um, do pretty well. I know there's quite a few questions about steroid and um, dosage of steroid. We're going to come back to that. But by and large, generally speaking, um, with steroid um, for inflammatory disorder, you're looking at one milligram to 1.5 milligram per kilogram. Depending on how high and how refractory these diseases has been, um, you're going to see um, different, um, uh, either 1 or 1.5. Um, in contrast to this case, which was our last case of the day, and then we'll come back to some of these questions. This is a 54-year-old female who also has swelling for about three months. So a little bit more acute. Uh, and I know there has been some question about pseudotumor. Uh, I agree that we don't really use the word pseudotumor anymore um, because it's kind of a misnomer. It's not really tumor. Uh, so now most people use the word idiopathic orbital inflammation. So this was a lady with uh, idiopathic inflammation. Um, so um, which of these tests would you think uh, you have to perform in someone who you're suspicious of idiopathic orbital inflammation, uh, but you're not sure? So I'll give you a second. And this kind of is the question that will put everything together. And I hope that you recognize some of these diagnoses are not so easy. Exactly. Yay. I'm glad you guys got the point of the story, which is that really idiopathic orbital inflammation is a diagnosis of exclusion. So it is um, something that you, you call it idiopathic orbital inflammation only after you cannot find um, um, one of the above causes that we have talked about. And um, there's uh, more and more uh, efforts at trying to better define it. Um, and there is a nice consensus statement published in 2017 in JAMA Ophthalmology uh, with a panel of expert, international experts, trying to kind of categorize some of the more common findings in IOI. Now, you'll see that a lot of these overlap with some of the other syndromes, maybe with the exception of bone being intact. So IOI, unlike, you know, IgG4, doesn't tend to involve bone, whereas you saw in my case of IgG4, there's some bone molding. Uh, they can be subacute site setting, uh, like in my case. So the, uh, the misconception is that, oh, IOI has to be like orbital cellulitis in its acute presentation. That's not necessarily the case. I would say more and more I'm seeing IOI that are subacute in presentation than acute acute, they have to have no other systemic disorder. So let's say you have a patient that look exactly like the one that I showed you with kind of fluffy orbital and uh, fast stranding, but they have no systemic sarcoid. Then I would say you really have to make sure this is not sarcoid uh, before you label it as IOI. Um, now, there's some um, pathological findings that is listed on the right there for you in terms of there has to be no necrosis because IOI do not necrose like some of our um, uh, IgG4 disease. And there is, you'll notice some positivity of IgG4 even with idiopathic orbital inflammation. So sometimes distinguishing between IOI and IgG4 is difficult. And because, you know, there's cutoff for what is is tolerable IgG4 because IgG4 is not, uh, it's a marker of inflammation, so it's not a marker on its own. Um, so you, you do tolerate some positivity of IgG4 even with IOI. Um, so in terms of IOI management, steroid is uh, by far probably your number one. And, and some of the dosage question earlier, so I do tend to start off with one milligram per kilogram uh, for steroid. And yes, when you think about that, that is very high dose. So that means I'm putting some patients uh, on 70, 80, sometimes 90 milligrams um, of prednisone a day with taper. Uh, if you're having a hard time tapering them completely off steroid, then you start 
adding some of these second agents, such as methotrexate, is usually our go-to. Uh, there's been some new literature talking about using rituximab as the go-to rather than steroid to try to decrease some of the side effect we know high-dose steroid and long-term use of steroid can cause. Um, and the literature looked at every two-week rituximab dosing and most of the patients in that uh, Korean study actually ended up needing four infusions of rituximab. Once again, rituximab for um, me um, in my practice in, in Canada uh, is very hard to justify because of the cost when I can easily give them steroid, which costs about 15 cents per pill. Um, recurrence actually do occur with IOI as well. So just because it's not one of these um, exciting uh, syndromes that I talked about earlier, um, IOI patients do have to warn about recurrences. I don't follow these patients long term. Instead, once I'm able to get them off steroid and quiet, what I tell them is you have a chance of in your lifetime of recurrence up to 30%. If it happens again, you know what it feels like, um, and it does mean that you have to be reinvestigated. And just because they had IOI once doesn't mean they can't get orbital cellulitis the next time. So you still have to rework everything up and make sure that you're not missing something before you can relabel them as IOI. Uh, so I hope that we cover some of these major approaches uh, to the spectrum of disease. We, by and large, I didn't cover everything because we don't have time to do that. We'll be here for days if that's the case. Uh, but I want you to at least have a diagnostic approach to avoid any over-treatment or under-treatment. And to do that, you have to know what are the most typical signs of each of the inflammatory syndrome. What are the CT features? What are the pathological feature? And then most importantly, to avoid any treatment uh, pitfall. What do I mean by that? There are patients that have complications from systemic disease. There are patients that are complication from surgical management. So you have to know where the danger zones are uh, and which patient are going to recur in order to know how not to get into trouble, so to speak. Um, so that is um, a whirlwind of orbital inflammatory disorders. Um, I will try to get into some of the questions um, now if people have time to stay on. If not, if not, what I will try to do is work with CyberSight to try to maybe answer some of these questions uh, with um, some other format. Um, recalcitrant IOI do happen, and, and those are the patients that you start on a uh, steroid sparing agent. And uh, cyclosporin or azotherapin are both um, uh, reasonable choices. Uh, I'm finding that rheumatology tend to favor methotrexate as the first agent, but I think azothiopurine is fine as the first choice as well. It's um, tend to um, bring things into remission a little bit less in the literature than methotrexate. Um, periocular steroid injection has always been controversial. So um, I get referral for periodical, uh, perio periocular steroid injections a lot for both uh, IOI as well as um, um, thyroid uh, eye disease, which is another topic I did not cover in inflammatory orbital syndromes. Uh, and part of the reason is because there's a there's beautiful lecture in CyberSci um, uh, library about specifically about thyroid already, so I wasn't going to duplicate uh, topics. Um, I will have to say that I do not find orbital steroid to be um, all that useful for general IOI or, or general thyroid. The one condition that I do find useful for thyroid is trochleitis. Uh, so those are a very specific um, disease entity. Um, if um, um, I fail steroid, my first choice is methotrexate, uh, just because I see the best uh, response with methotrexate. Um, about fungal orbital infection in diabetes, yes, so absolutely. So there are, uh, if patients are immunosuppressed um, and diabetes falls into that spectrum of immunosuppression, uh, you have to think about fungal and you have to think about um, um, necrotizing fasciitis earlier than a patient who is non-immunocompromised. Um, so there's a lot of question about refractory steroid as I scroll through this. Uh, so uh, those have, uh, is a duplicate and I've answered them already. Um, there is an interesting question about how do you manage uh, post-inflammatory fibrosis? Mohammed, that's a great question. Um, I 
I find that it is, the honest truth is it's difficult. Um, however, um, I will say uh, that is probably one population I do do uh, intralegional steroid injection. Um, the other agent to think about is 5-FU. So I'm finding that I'm using 5-FU more and more. So I used to use 5-FU a lot for most of my cosmetic cases for scarring uh, control. And I'm finding that I'm using 5-FU and uh, mitomycin a lot more in orbit. Um, so in orbital fibrosis, especially if there's e uh, extraocular muscle involvement, uh, I'm using a combination of mitomycin, 5-FU, and steroid to try to control some of those fibrosis. Now, I'm not talking about injecting it directly into the muscle. I'm talking about injecting it around the muscle to try to free up some of those um, um, strands of fibrosis that happen. Um, and yeah, sometimes that may require me to do a surgical scar release and then inject medication around that area of fibrosis. Um, orbital fibrosis triggered by sinus surgery. Um, so it's it's possible, especially with some of the uh, Wagner's patients when they do reconstructions. Um, if you're talking about sinus surgery that the, uh, from sinusitis and that triggering orbital fibrosis, that is highly unlikely. Uh, and the reason is because they are supposed to keep, um, or they, they do keep bone intact. So there should not be any transmission to the orbit from sinusitis surgery. Uh, if you are seeing that, then I would say you have to dig a little deeper and just make sure that there is nothing else going on. Um, so uh, intralesional injection for Langerhans cell histiocytosis, what dose do you use? Um, so there's actually no particular dosage per se. So usually it depends on how large of an area. Uh, I like using 40 milligram per mil um, um, for my injection just because then the volume is smaller. Um, so I usually draw up the volume that I think the lesion will take quote unquote, so to speak. And typically that ends up being um, like five milligrams or less. So for the sake of time, and I know everyone has to go yet. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, and I'm sorry that I couldn't get to, it to everyone's question, but I'm so happy to see that uh, there's such great engagement that people have lots of questions uh, about the spectrum of disease. So thank you everyone. And um, I hope to see you guys another time on another CyberSci lecture.